Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'd like to start out by uh, thanking Sheriff G and his staff uh, for having this academy. I can tell you uh, last year I was part of the graduation ceremony and I was tremendously impressed with all the young, women, young men and women that attended it. Uh, you've got a great future ahead of you and I can tell you that Sheriff uh, G and our chief, Jane Castor, have a tremendous working relationship together and you can see by the, uh, the staff that's supporting you this week, uh, that's an extension of that relationship. So <clears throat> I kind of want to talk to you uh, in a different dimension of leadership today. Um, you know, of course, everybody in the room that's working with you has a, a leadership background of some sort, and they also have a different uh, background in their personal life as well as their professional life, and they all bring it together for the common good of law enforcement and public safety. But because you're the next generation of leaders and we look towards you to take care of us when we're done doing what we're doing, uh, we have to talk uh, probably a little more broad and some generalities. So I think uh, that was a great segue, that, that uh, video that led into different types of leaders. And uh, if you could hit the first slide. I'll tell you, in the experience that I've had with leadership, um, you know, I mean, you take somebody who's a born leader. Uh, the first one that comes to mind for me is somebody like George Washington. Um, you go back and you look at his history uh, in the United States and the beginnings of, of our country. And, you know, sometimes when people say, well, what is a born leader? Well, back then it, some, it had something to do with your stature. Uh, some people were, were tall and they were commanding and they just had a, a natural ability to take over a room when they came in. And I don't necessarily think that that's the case anymore, but that was the case. And a lot of people will say, well, is it something you're born with or something you aspire to? Which leads me to my next point. Are you a developed leader? Um, as you take your journey, your next step into adulthood and, and go to college and you know, find your profession and, and look for the things that, uh, that allow you to make a difference in the world, um, you're going to develop. And you're going to find things during your developmental process that allow you to become a leader because you have certain gifts. And everybody in this room is strong in one aspect and maybe not so strong in another. But when you come together, probably, and I didn't even see any of it, but probably like the team building exercise you just did, somebody could tap into an experience or a skill set that maybe others in the team building exercise maybe didn't have at the moment. And they can adapt and become that leader. Uh, through a developmental process. And then there's what I like to call a situational leader. Um, somebody in our office the other day was telling me a story out in California where somebody who was distraught walked out in the water and they were going to drown themselves and 75 people on the beach just stood there and did what amounted to nothing. And they let this person drown. Now, if somebody really wants to drown himself, it's a dangerous thing. And maybe everybody on the beach didn't feel like they had a skill set to go out there and wrestle with somebody who wanted to kill himself in the water. But, you know, you could have made a human chain where you were protected. You could have made phone calls. You could have done something. So you could be put into a situation where you're a situational leader for that very small moment in time. You could be at the community pool and there could be an infant that falls in the water and you take the initiative to dive in and pull the infant out. And that'll just come. That'll come based on your experiences, but sometime you have to overcome fear. And everybody has fear. 27 years in policing and a long time on the SWAT team and doing a lot of different things that are, most people would consider dangerous still have fear. But what happens is the, as you journey in life, you learn how to suppress that fear faster and then you just work through it. And that's really just part of the maturation process of dealing with fear. So a lot of times your leadership is maybe hamstringed by fear and in a situation that you may actually find a way to overcome that. And then we talk about, well, what is a leader? I mean, we could sit here all day and define different aspects of leaders, but you just saw an interesting example of adaptation leadership. Somebody took a group and they, they took charge and people followed. So without followers, you really don't necessarily have a leader. And then the next question that I would say is, well, <clears throat> if you're a leader, is it, your followers, are you going down an ethical path or are you just being leading a group? I mean, a terrorist is a leader. There's different types of leaders out there that can do things good and they can do things bad. So you have to decide 
as you journey through life, you're going to find and ex be exposed to different types of leaders that do things for what we would call right and wrong. So <clears throat> as you do your leadership journey, you're going to be assessing other leaders. And I can tell you, there was a study done after World War II of all the soldiers that were involved that survived World War II, and they were asked, what was the most important characteristic uh, for a leader to have? And they all came back, and the majority of the answer was to the ability to do self-assessment. And that's, that's a big step, because a lot of times we think we're right as individuals, and as we do, and we, we get honed in our ways, and then the older you get, like me, then you become kind of stagnant in your ways, and you're not really willing to adapt and change. But I can tell you, the most successful people in life and the best leaders have the ability to have an open mind. They do self-assessment. Every day I wake up, I try and figure out how I did something wrong in the last 24 hours and how can I correct it in the next 24 hours. And yesterday's gone and tomorrow's in here yet, so all we have is today to work with. And that comes from Mother Teresa, who did a lot of leadership without any expectation of <clears throat> uh, self-grandization or any expectation of uh, accolades from anybody. And it's tough to lead when you're not getting any notoriety. Um, you're just doing it because it's the right thing to do. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, you know, when we think about success, um, you know, a lot of times it gets translated into our social status. What kind of cars we drive, what kind of house we own, how much money we have in our pocket or in our bank account. That's not necessarily the case. Um, it really should center around a goal. Um, you know, a lot of times you'll sit back and say, well, what have I achieved? I think everybody in the room just recently graduated and they probably have excellent scores, otherwise you wouldn't be in this program. And there's something about you that has attracted the community to be the next leaders. And you've achieved a lot. But at some point we have to ask ourselves, well, like for me, I could have achieved 27 years of law enforcement, but have I really accomplished anything? Have I really made a difference in a career or in somebody's life? And that's for, for you to reflect back on as you journey through your life. You will have achievements just by getting up every morning and, and doing things that are structured in your life. But as you go through those achievements, you're going to have to sit back and say, what have I really accomplished? And the key to that is to understand what your goals are. Your goals can be short-term, mid-term, or long-term, but they should factor into something that will give you a sense of accomplishment when they're done, not just something that you achieved. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, the one interesting thing about achievement and accomplishment, they're both the opposite of failure. So sometimes we have to go through an achievement process until our accomplishment process shows up. And I'll give you an example as it relates to crime fighting. Um, eight years ago, or eight and a half years ago, the Tampa Police Department didn't do a really good job of crime fighting. We were the number two city of our size in the nation for high crime. And we changed the rules. We rewrote our mission statement. We made it very small. We realized that the only thing we were supposed to do every day was reduce crime, improve people's quality of life, and do it through partnerships because we knew we couldn't do it alone. Well, eight and a half years later, we had a 61% drop in crime over those years because, mostly because of the partnerships, like the one we share with the sheriff's office, the professional partnerships, the community partnerships, and internally, we just never quit. We were constantly reinventing ourselves. And we've been on this journey now for eight and a half years, and it is a sense of accomplishment because we set a goal and we work to that goal every year as a team, and those kind of things require all types of leaders I mentioned before. Some of the born leaders, some of the developed leaders, and then in some case situational leadership to make tough decisions under tough sets of circumstances. And you'll be faced with that as well in the future. But one thing it did is it always lacked failure. We were not going to fail. Next slide. Please. I thought this was interesting, so I put it on there. <clears throat> this is a quick formula for success that I came across. Einstein, Albert Einstein, of course, genius. <clears throat> He said, if success equals an A, then A equals X plus Y plus Z, and X is work. And I can tell you, you won't get anywhere without hard work. You won't get anywhere without hard work in your studies. Nothing comes easy. And if you're gifted and a certain aspect of your life comes easy, then 
you're going to be challenged in some other category to round you out. But I can tell you, as hard as you work, and I'm kind of a hypocrite in this area because I don't play as enough as I should, you've got to take time to play. And as you grow older and through your college years and your family years and your professional years, you're going to have to take time out because it, it recharges your batteries and it makes you complete. And the more complete you are, the better leader you can be because you'll be more understanding to other people's sets of circumstances. And that really is a huge part of being a leader is tolerance. And if you can tolerate things because you understand them and you're empathetic to them versus just being sympathetic, you'll be a tremendous leader. So we got past the work and play. And the next part, I'll tell you what, it's very hard. And I don't mean it like in a harsh way. That's why I softened up a little bit. But <coughs> truly, it's worked for me just to sit back and listen for 27 years because I learn something every day from every aspect of my, my life. I learn something from my seven-year-old when I'm going out the door, and I learn something from the chief of police or the... If I run into the sheriff, I learn something. And the fact is, to have an open mind, you have to keep your mouth shut. And the more we catch ourselves trying to talk in the middle of somebody's communication process, the less we can absorb it. And the less we absorb it, the less we can process and contemplate it. So I can tell you, if you're going to truly be a success, you're going to have to work extremely hard in whatever you do. You're going to have to play hard to balance that out, mind, body, and spirit constantly. You always want to make sure you're energizing your mind, you're exercising your body to stay healthy, and you're taking it all in. That's kind of what it really means to me. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I came across this book when I was studying at the University of Notre Dame a couple years ago. It's, uh, it's written by a Harvard professor. It's called Five Minds for the Future. And I'll tell you what, it really, when I talked about mind, body, and spirit earlier, it really is an excellent read for somebody like yourself who's getting ready to go into college. Now, it's not that easy of a read. It's, he's a psychologist at, at Harvard, and, uh, but I, I think it's, it's, it's very appropriate for your journey. And if you read the slide, because I don't like to read slides to people, but essentially what he's trying to say up here is you need to have holistic instruction and education. You need to take in all of these things that the planet is offering you at home, in your scholastic environment, your family environment, you need to bring it all in and not shut down any doors. And because you do that, and you use this five mind principle that I'm gonna walk through in a minute, it'll make you very well-rounded in your understanding. And the more well-rounded you are, the better leader you'll become in the future. Next slide, please. The first one is the discipline mind basically says you need to be good at something. And I think the math up there will talk about uh, <clears throat> 10 years or 10,000 hours of focused work. I'm sure there's some defensive tactics instructors in here, but when I was teaching defensive tactics, which is basically uh, you know, arrest techniques and those kind of things to officers, we used to say it would take 100 repetitions to build muscle memory. And once you build that muscle memory, then you can use it in an emergency. Drawing your gun out of your holster, Okay, these holsters have been gotten a lot more complicated than when I came on. When I came on, the gun used to just fall out of the holster, and it used to be pretty dangerous. Now, it's a vault. And if, when you get off the street, and you live in the fog like I do in the downtown building, you don't have an opportunity to unholster very often. But that doesn't change my responsibility. If I walk to the bank and there's a bank robbery, I'm still going to be expected to serve in my uniform as I did with three years on the department, as I do with 27 years on. So my point is, I still have to retain those skills. And if I'm going to wear this uniform, then I have to know that within reason, I can perform my duties no matter what I'm doing and no matter where I'm at. So you have to be good at something. And so you really need to focus, because if you dabble in this and you dabble in that, you'll never really get good at it. And you already know the direction you're on, or you're going to be investigating and exploring those directions as you enter the college world and your next tier of education. And it'll find you. It's, it's something that you kind of have a projection on, but I can tell you how many officers we hire, because I sit in the selection committees, they've done all kinds of things in their life that and they never dreamed, including me. I planned to be an architect, and it wasn't very long into that journey I realized that 
I was not going to sit in that environment for the rest of my life, and I needed to do something with more action and, and more public service. And that's how I fell into this. And I'll tell you what, I wouldn't have changed it for the world. And that may happen to you as well. But once you lock into something, you're going to have to excel at it. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorites. Um, I can tell you that modern law enforcement, which is what I know, you can't do this unless you can harness all the stuff coming at you. Now, all of you gamers that grew up in the gaming era, you should be doing really well at this because I watch my son do things on TV that I don't know how he can pick this out and talk to that person all at the same time. So I know that his synthesizing mind is, is going on. But you have to take that skill in every aspect of your life and take all this disparate data, fuse it together, and make it make sense. And I can tell you that if you can do this, if you can develop this portion of your mind through your schooling and your career, that again, you'll become an effective leader. Now, you don't have to take a lot of notes because I did make a CD for everybody. I just wanted to see how many people were going to write. Um, I made you a copy of the PowerPoint presentation because it comes with a homework assignment at the end. All right, the next slide, please. <laughs> yeah. You're probably told no homework. Well. I didn't hear that part. Um, the creating mind. Again, this is one of my other favorites. I can tell you that uh, some of the greatest people in the world said that imagination is more important than knowledge. And as we get older, you'll find that your imagination, because you're going to be in structured environments. Let's go back to that, that video again. The, you saw the paramilitary, or, well, actually, it was the true military organization of all the platoons and the history of the army and everything going on and all of a sudden you came, here comes this radical bunch that had some kind of training and conformity to what they were doing but it was a radical departure of what everybody else was doing. Well I can tell you what, it attracted the attention of the commander at the podium because he needed a project and he needs some creativity and it just was a perfect opportunity to take that squad and send them on that assignment according to the video. Well. Let me tell you the, the danger with a creative mind, because I've faced this in my career. There's some folks that will come to the table, and I, I could be one of those, that have an idea every day. Every day I come up with an idea, okay, let's try this, let's try that. Well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> the way you get a creative mind and people to listen to your imagination is credibility. And credibility comes from doing your job every single day consistently but that doesn't mean you become a robot. That just means that you're dependable. And the more dependable you are and the more trustworthy you are, then when you have a creative hotspot, people will listen to you because you've developed all of that credibility throughout your life. And it's huge because I can show you great examples of people that had very creative thought, but they lacked a lot of credibility and people would dismiss it at least temporarily, because they really weren't buying into the person that was giving them the creative option. So you have to have credibility. Every once in a while, there's going to be that flashpoint where somebody can come marching in, like in the video, and grab somebody's mind, but that's rare. That's the exception, not the rule. So you want to develop credibility, but you never want to suppress your creativity or your imagination. And I can tell you, um, I just got accepted to the Naval Academy for their postgraduate uh, master's degree in Homeland Security and all of the pre-reading that I'm doing before I go up to Baltimore relates to a lack of imagination about protecting the United States during the 9-11 attacks. And see what happens in government especially you get into that rut and you start thinking the same way every day and there's a bureaucracy and you can't change that or you don't want to change it because it's outside of people's comfort zones. You've got to challenge that. You've got to poke holes at it constantly with your credibility intact and try and make changes. And if you do that, then your imagination can forecast things. And the more you can forecast in a professional way, the better leader you're going to be. And you're going to be great for whatever you're doing in the future. Next slide, please. Of course, respectful mind. It kind of goes back to that formula that was up there earlier with Einstein. Um, taking things in, being respectful in the settings. I'll tell you, there's, uh, there's something that we talked about again at the University of Notre Dame called the loss of the sacred. That people, tradition's important, but not enough 
to a point that it doesn't allow you to change, but you have to respect tradition. Tradition is there for a purpose, especially if it was based on or its origins were good things. And as you evolve in life, you want to respect that sacred time and those sacred principles, and having respectful mind will help you do that. And then lastly, an ethical mind, which the definition of ethics is very simple, and you'll hear it talked about with morality constantly. But between morality, right and wrong, and ethics, which is the foundations of your thought processes for right and wrong, that's going to be huge. Now, everybody has a different version of right and wrong, but there's curb lines. And you say, okay, well, I may be on the left side of the road with my thoughts on right and wrong, and somebody else may be on the right side of the road with their thoughts of right and wrong, but you know what? We're still within the curb lines. I don't care where you go, killing people can't be a good thing. Okay, just can't be a good thing. Peace is a good thing, so you have to try and find a way to get there. And of course, if you have to take a life in an emergency or there's some other prevailing reason, well then, in that scope of that situation, it may be ethical and it may be moral to do that. But for the most part, it can't be a good thing. So you have to take those extremes and then work your way down. And sometimes, as humans, we get so caught up in our personal interests and our personal beliefs that we don't pull back and have that respectful mind and that creative mind going to say, wow, you know, if I, if I traveled and I learned more about culture and I learned more about the planet or I did this, I would have a broader understanding of things and I would be more tolerant. And then the more tolerant I become, the more applicable I can use my leadership to that tolerance. And that's really where I think we have to journey as a, not only as a nation, but as a planet. This is the book. Um, Again, I'm going to leave you with a CD. It, it kind of introduces those five minds, but if this book is of interest to you, then I suggest maybe you, you put that in your personal library. Now I guess you'd load it on your Kindle or your iPad or whatever you do with it, and then you would take it from there. What I want to do now is I want to take a departure from those five minds, and I want to talk about what you're going to face in the globe, the global setting, uh, as you journey over the next... 40 years. All right, next slide. All right, let's talk about our planet for a minute. And all of a sudden, you're like, where's he going with this on leadership? Well, I'll tell you what, <clears throat> every decision you make, whether you buy bottled water, whether you water your lawn today, whether what car you drive, all these things are starting to, will start to impact the planet and our population. Right now, we have about the mid billions and 6.8 billion people on the planet. Well, if you look down here in the United States in 2050, and we're pushing 395 million, and we're going to reach 9 billion people, it's going to get a bit crowded, and it's going to get a bit demanding. And I can tell you that we're going to start using up about three planets worth of resources for the one planet we're living on. And some of you may have studied a little bit of this, but you have to start looking forward and saying, okay, this slide I think was built in 2003, Okay, so if you can back up your mind, and it said people that were 15 to 24 <coughs> making decisions when you're adults are going to impact the decision whether we're 9 billion, 10 billion, or 11 billion people by the time 2050 comes around. And 2050 sounds like a space age to you. Probably I won't be here, but there's a really good chance that you're going to be right in the peak or on the upper end of your earnings and decision-making points. And if you could put this slide in the back of your mind and said, Every decision you make about population growth and understanding and planet management, as you do, whatever you do in your life, and you say, well, how can a policeman make a decision about, well, you know what, I'm at a point that I affect our budget, and I can make decisions about what kind of cars we drive, I can make decisions on what kind of space we use in our buildings, I can make decisions on, in different partnerships and how things get a little bit greener every day in policing. Well, imagine if every industry in the world did the same thing. They started making decisions. I can make decisions on what uniforms we wear and where they're bought from and whether they're using child slave labor to make our uniforms or not. All those things, I have a responsibility to dig deeper and make decisions as a leader that affects not only my company, the Tampa Police Department, but it affects the entire planet. Does that make sense? Okay. That all has to do with population. Next slide. Now I want to talk about resource sucking. Okay. Here we are, the ecological footprint. <clears throat> the United States 
is using about five times of the world average in resources and about 10 times what would be humanly sustainable for life, okay? Which means we use a lot of stuff. And you can see we're number two on the list worldwide um, based on everything that we're using. And <clears throat> of course, the bigger, the bigger countries uh, and the more developed countries tend to do about the same thing. And what happens here as a leader, you get caught up into, well, everybody else is doing it. You know, everybody else is driving a Hummer. Everybody else is doing this. And, and I'm just going to, it's my turn to get my share. Well, until you and your generation starts to shift that thinking in a professional way that we talked about earlier, using those five minds and, and being respectful and protecting everything and not just, and I'll tell you what, you guys are going to kind of be victims of our generation because it, probably in the mid-century, uh, you know, <clears throat> 1950, things got really good. And there was a lot of growth and a lot of things going on and people just started spending and using and then technology fused that and next thing you know, we were throwing things out faster than we can buy something new. And that's part of the generation we're living in now. But if your next generation, children and grandchildren are gonna survive on this planet, we have to start making a dramatic difference now in the resources that we use and how much we're using them. So again, this is just a teaser on things that you probably need to start looking at if you're gonna be an effective leader in the future no matter what you do in life, okay? I just kinda of wanna give you uh, one of the resources that seems to be the most scary. I don't know how public knowledge this is, but the Pentagon, everybody knows what the Pentagon is, they develop war plans for theoretical wars. Well, there's actually war plans being dr drawn up for water. Okay, at some point, we may try and colonize the sun and say, okay, well, you can only have this much sun. That's how dramatic this stuff is getting if we don't start watching ourselves. And if you look at water use, this world is scaled based on how much water is being used in each, each country um, and, of course, each continent. And that's what these maps are designed to do, to give you a dramatic impact and understanding on how fast we're using things and how fast we're depleting things. And I'll give you a better example that's easier to drill down. Next example. And I brought this in so I could be the hypocrite of the day. If you, if you scan the slide real fast, this bottle of water took 6.75 bottles of water to make. Okay, so I'm drinking one and I'm pouring out 6.75 bottles of water on the ground. So wasting it, basically, to make this bottle of water. Not to mention the petroleum used to make this plastic. If you look at it on an annual basis, it could supply the United States for fuel for two and a half days. And I'll tell you what, the other thing is, if you do any research on water, you'll find out that by drinking bottled water, you're basically putting arsenic in your body off of the bottle. So tap water is the best. Something you can fill up all the time and take with you is the best. And that's the mindset that we have to start doing on the, on the planet side to make a difference. Now, I have cases of bottled water in my house. Water, bottled water is outselling every other type of drink in the world. And it's just, I don't want to say it's a fad. It's good that everybody's drinking water, but now we have to become the next tier of responsible citizens with our water use and how we package it, commodify it. Does that make sense? Okay. And there's some other things on here. How much water does it take to make a cup of coffee? 35 gallons. Okay. Now, of course, that, it's all the growing process and manufacturing process. But every time we go to Starbucks, 35 gallons of water for a cup of coffee. Hamburger, almost eight, you know, anywhere from four to 8,000 gallons to make a hamburger by the time you process the cow, do everything else and get it into that wrapper, all right? Piece of paper takes three gallons of water. So the next time you crumble one up, ask yourself, well, why didn't I put it in the recycling bin, okay? <clears throat> and I already went through the bottled water part. And this is just a snapshot. I'm not saying I'm gonna run out and hug a tree and that's not exactly where I'm going here. What I'm trying to do is just start to change your mindset because you are the future. You're very sharp individuals. Obviously, you have a gift or you wouldn't be sitting in this room. And you are going to be the instruments of change. And if you don't understand what you're changing and you just accept the world, just like I accepted crime back eight and a half years ago, if we just accept it, and everybody says, well, a washing machine works hard too. Okay, it doesn't mean it's getting anywhere. It's, what is it producing? What am I accomplishing? And that's where you have to start changing your mindset to be an effective leader in all categories. 
And again, this is just some examples. I could go on all day about different aspects and different veins of leadership that are going to make a difference for you in a holistic way. So I hope some of this made sense. This is your homework assignment. <clears throat> I have the website on the CD. This is called, put your hand up if you've ever seen the story of stuff. I see one hand. All right, this talks about the rate that we're using and getting rid of things and what it's doing to our planet. And I think there's really a good opportunity here for you just to have an understanding. Again, if it really sparks your interest, this could be something that attracts you in the future and maybe you can take a, a strong stance to it. But at least, no matter what you do as a leader and as the future of not only America but of the planet, you'll be able to at least translate some of these decisions that you're exposed to in this academy and your college years and your new career years as it relates to our, you know, not only our planet, but in a sense our universe and the way we operate for the next chapter of humanity. So that's what a leader is. It's somebody who achieves and ultimately accomplishes change throughout their lifetime. And it's a, I'll tell you what, I've tried to think of it as a sprint every day, but it really is a marathon. So if you're going to sprint, make sure you've got a camel back on with some water because I'll tell you what, it, it'll wear you out fast. Um, so that's where the play part comes in. You have to find a way to balance your hard work and your play while you're taking all of this in and you have all these responsibilities. Obviously, you're very gifted students and you have a great future ahead of you. And part of that comes with a tremendous amount of responsibility. Um, you know, again, at work and home and, and uh, even at play. So I wish all of you well. That's the end of my presentation, unless there's any questions. I'm going to hand out these CDs to you, and hopefully I'll get to see you at graduation. <laughs>